Uh, I was so excited last week. Uh, it, it dawned on me uh, that we were approaching the one-year mark of, of the first time that we introduced ourselves to each other, uh, but I was wrong. It wasn't last week. It was today. Time flies when you're having fun. Uh, I cannot believe that regardless of whether it was 51 weeks or 52 weeks, uh, time has truly flown by that we have now officially uh, known each other for, for exactly one year. Uh, and some of you I've known a little bit before that. Uh, you may or may not know this, but I came uh, back in like middle of January uh, and, and met the board. And, and we interviewed and had a really good time. Uh, and, and then actually it started even before that with, with a Skype interview uh, with, with the board. And I was sitting there in, in, at our house in Arkansas. They were sitting downstairs uh, in the youth room. And so uh, for some of you, I've actually known you now for uh, almost 16 months. Uh, and uh, that's, that's exciting and, and, and really uh, amazing that that time has flown by this much. In fact, we're uh, in the midst of a membership class uh, this morning, and I was telling uh, Caleb uh, how much I, I love this church, and, and from day one, we have felt like this was just home for us. I don't know if you still feel that way about me, but uh, know that I feel that way about you, uh, and, and we are excited to continue to journey uh, with you trusting in the faithfulness of God, uh, that he will guide us and carry us uh, and see us to, I think, honestly, our best days as a community of faith. Do you believe that God is still working? Do you believe that God's not done with us yet? Oh, good. I'm so glad that most of you said that. Whew. Well, it is Valentine's Day. The good news is, is that it's still snowing outside, so that means your wait times in restaurants ought to be quicker. <laughs> so, you know, if, you, if you're going to plan on going out today, know that you're, you're probably going to have less people around you. So there you go. I guess that's one of the bonuses of, of snow. Uh, like I said earlier, I, I honestly didn't know how to react today uh, when, when, when it was coming uh, to, you know, snow and uh, coming from Arkansas, if, if it threatened to snow, we canceled. Uh, and so we've canceled a couple Wednesday nights. Uh, we, we had to cancel this last Wednesday night because of snow. Uh, and then the, the previous time we did that, uh, I canceled maybe a little bit too early. Uh, you see, there in the town that I was from in Heber Springs, or uh, where we were at in Heber Springs, we, we didn't have any salt treks. So uh, I, it was like uh, this glorious sight when as soon as the snow started to fall, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing like salt trucks just out and about, and, th and that's a foreign uh, thing to me, uh, where it was not uncommon for us that when it would snow or ice in a combination of the two, uh, there were a few occasions where we were trapped inside our house for five days. Imagine being trapped in, in my house for five days <laughs> with three little boys. My wife's not here this morning. One of our boys is sick. Uh, and so imagine being trapped in the house with three little boys and me. <laughs> she will have an extra uh, jewel in her crown uh, one day. She is, she is a saint. Um, well, today, I'm so, it marks the first Sunday of Lent. Uh, and I'm glad that you are here worshiping with us this morning at Belleville First Church of the Nazarene. I want to remind you that uh, at any point that you miss a message uh, you can go online to our website, bfcn.org, and you can uh, view those. Uh, we are about to, we're being recorded right now, uh, not live, but we are being recorded, and we're, we're getting ready to set up a YouTube channel. So uh, I know that uh, I'm just a, a pleasure to look at. Uh, and so if you don't like to listen audioly to a message, you can always go on to our YouTube channel that's going to be uh, up and running here soon, and you can catch uh, messages. And one day, because of days like today, we are going to have live streaming services, uh, which will be good. And so then you are going to be on the internet. You should be more excited about that. You won't be seen. I will be. So there you go. The relief and the stress is off you. We are still trying to figure out how to make me look better on a camera. Uh, and, and hopefully uh, we can do that. Uh, I, I looked at the video this week. Yes, I know. I need to powder my head. Um, 
but uh, with HD cameras and everything, uh, man, I just, I don't look that good anymore. Uh, and so we're hopefully going to polish that up a little bit. Uh, you need to laugh, okay? It, it, it's okay. Uh, Self-deprecating humor, it's all right to have every once in a while. Uh, but we are in our first Sunday of Lent, and everything kicked off uh, this past Wednesday with Ash Wednesday. And, and Lent will come to a close on March 26th, Holy Saturday, the Saturday before Easter Sunday. Now, if, if you've ever followed along with Lent, um, you know that it's a time of preparation for us to. And, and back in the day, it was a time for uh, those who were wishing to be baptized. It was, it was a time of, of prayer and reflection uh, and, and even repentance. But then, because we've always believed as the community of faith that this is a communal thing, the entire community of the baptized would join them uh, in this time of, of prayer and fasting and reflection. Uh, and so we continue that trend today in many churches. In fact, some of you have probably have given up something for Lent. Uh, how many of you have given up coffee? Oh, blessings on you. I gave up coffee one time. It was not pretty. Uh, my family did not like me. Uh, but they enjoyed me on Sundays because Sunday is a day of celebration, right? Because every Sunday, and Pastor Bruce reminded us, reminded us of this during the interim, that today we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So today is a celebration day. You, Trisha, get to have coffee. Yes! <laughs> Gave up social media one year, and that was much better. Um, but even for us today, it, it's a time of, of preparation for Easter Sunday, uh, whether you're giving up something or maybe whether you are choosing to donate your time to maybe a charity or clothing or, or even funds to a charity. Uh, Lent is not always about giving up something. Sometimes it's about doing things for others. Uh, and so as we begin this journey in Lent, I, I want to encourage you to, to take some time and just prayerfully consider what it means to follow Christ. Last week was Transfiguration Sunday, and so we were uh, in Matthew's gospel there in chapter 17. And this, this morning, all throughout the world, uh, pastors and preachers are, are, are speaking and preaching on the temptation of Christ. Now, as with last week's text, Matthew, Mark, Luke, the synoptic writers, they all describe the temptation of Christ. Now, Mark only has two verses. Mark is very succinct, short, and to the point. I think that's why I've always enjoyed the gospel of Mark more than Matthew or Luke. But, but each tells this story in their own unique way. And so as we begin this journey in Lent, we're going to talk about the temptation of Christ in Matthew's gospel. So will you stand with me this morning? in honor of God's word, and open up your, your Bible or your Bible app to Matthew chapter 4, starting in verse 1, going to verse 11. And again, I want to remind you that whenever the gospel is read, it's always a read amongst the people. God came to us in Christ Jesus. That's the best news you're going to hear this morning. And so whenever the gospel of, is read, it's always read amongst the people. Hear the word of the Lord according to St. Matthew, chapter 4, starting in verse 1, going to verse 11. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, All of these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan. 
For it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him, and suddenly the angels came and waited on him. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray that in these next few moments, that you would give us ears to hear, Lord, and hearts that are open, Lord, to a passage that I know is probably familiar to most this morning. May we hear anew and afresh this important text and moment for us this morning. And all God's people said, Amen. You may be seated. Everything about this text reminds us of the Exodus. You have the wilderness. You have the 40 days and, and, and 40 nights reminiscent of Israel's 40-year journey through the wilderness. Of course, Matthew also wants us to understand that, that what God is doing in Christ Jesus is a new exodus. It's this new movement of freedom and, and liberation for all people now. Wilderness is always seen in Scripture as this place of potential chaos, danger. I remember preaching one time on this wilderness journey, and I, I think if we could be honest this morning, I think we've all have had moments, and maybe some of you even now are having moments when you feel like you're going through the wilderness. Have you ever had those moments? We're just, it doesn't seem to make sense. Life seems hard and, and, and difficult and, and trying, more so than it usually is anyway. Wilderness is always a place of danger and chaos. But it's also a time of preparation, which is what it was for the people of Israel. You see, one of my professors would often say that the real miracle of Exodus wasn't getting Israel out of Egypt. It was getting Egypt out of Israel. Think about that for a second. You see, it really matters that we prepare ourselves to become the people of God. That There is this idea of preparation. And whether we like it or not, sometimes testing is a part of our preparation for service. Nobody said amen there. We don't like that idea. We certainly don't like to endure it. I will never forget the time I was sitting there, and I may have shared this story with you, but I was sitting in the basement of our house, and I was studying for one of my finals uh, with the book of Romans, and I had one of those moments where I just I felt like I wasn't called into ministry. Uh, and it was one of those dark night of the soul moments. And I'm sitting down there in the basement and I'm all alone. I didn't want to call Stephanie to come down because that would just seem like the, the childish thing to do at the moment. And for about 10 minutes, I felt this fear that I'd never, ever felt before. I mean, I was on the verge of graduating from seminary just a few weeks away. And now was a very bad time for me to decide that this was not what God had for me. You have to understand that after eight years of preparing yourself for this moment, all of a sudden, all of the fears and all of the trepidation and all the uncertainties and insecurities just seemed to overwhelm me at once. And it was a very fearful and frightening moment for Aaron Lynn. I think we all endure moments of testing. We just don't always like it. Matthew tells us here that the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be, to be tempted by the devil. And for 40 days and 40 nights, he fasted. And at the end of that, of course, he's famished. And then you have this set of three temptations, right? And the, and the first two, the devil is playing on the words that, that was the words heard at the baptism of Jesus, right? This is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Did you notice that those first two temptations begin with the word if? If you are the Son of God, why don't you turn these you know, stones into bread? 
If you are the son of God, why don't you just throw yourself down? Because, you know, the devil knew scripture. He, he misquoted it. And he interpreted it for his own gain. But he understood Psalm 91 a little better than most. God's not going to let you fall. God's not going to hurt you. You are so central to his movement. If you are the son of God. I imagine he's whispering. Prove it. I mean, I can certainly understand that after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, you would be famished. That the very first thing you would probably want in that moment is food. Now, I've never fasted for that long. But I can tell you that the times that I have, and I can assure you, it has been well short of 40 days. I have always been hungry. It seems to make sense. Would you turn these stones into bread? If you are the son of God, just go ahead and, and, and jump down. God's going to rescue you. He's going to send the angels to rescue you. It has to do with provisions in the first temptation and heavenly protection in the second one. But then the devil gets really bold in a third one. Why don't you just worship me and I will give you power as if this world has never seen before. I'll show you all the kingdoms of this world and all of their splendor, and it could be yours if you would just bow down and worship me. All three times, Jesus quotes Scripture back to the devil. In fact, those three passages that, that Jesus quotes come from Deuteronomy 6 through 8. And it was a pretty important moment for the people of Israel as they're in the wilderness because what Matthew is trying to tell us is that where Israel failed, ultimately, Christ will succeed. That's really good news for us. And eventually, the devil leaves him alone and the angels come and surround Christ. Now, I know, what does this text mean for us, right? I mean, that's, that's the question that we always have to ask ourselves week in and week out, whether it's here on a Sunday morning or whether it's we're doing our devotionals to get our, alone or together as a group of people. We always ask the question, what does this mean for us? Well, the reality is, is that we will face temptations, now, I know we don't want to say amen there because nobody wants to face temptations. But the reality is that we will face temptations. We will go through periods of testing. The enemy always tempts. God often tests. And, and there's a difference between the two. But you're probably thinking to yourselves this morning, I've never been tempted, quite honestly, to turn stone into bread. And I'm pretty sure that if we were to take a poll this morning, you would probably say the same. But how often are we tempted to mistrust the deeds of our Heavenly Father? I'm sure that none of us here this morning have ever tried to prove God in jumping off a high pinnacle. Please don't. But have we ever been guilty of losing faith in the helpfulness of God when things go awry? That's hard. I know some of you have had a really tough year. We've all endured tough years. We've all endured tough moments. And it is so easy to just completely discredit the faithfulness of God when you feel so alone. I 
I can be honest with you, the lures and the temptations and the seductions of this world when it comes to power have always been alluring. It's always been a temptation for us. The problem here in this text has to do with the things that the devil was tempting Christ. He was offering a kingdom without a cross. And that's always a problem when you're dealing with the kingdom of God. That's why this sermon is always preached on the first Sunday of Lent. Because Lent is all about a journey towards the cross. In fact, that's what I love about the Gospel of Mark, because what Mark is always saying to us in this, this idea of this cost of discipleship is that the cross always casts a shadow over the entire Gospel of Mark. You can't have the kingdom without the cross. You can't endure times of testing without the cross. You can't have new life without the cross. It costs us something. I was listening to ESPN the radio the other day, and on the channel uh, comes this commercial about this guy who's apparently coming to our area to, to flip houses, and he's got this organization that, you know, apparently is, you know, all reward and no risk. It's about getting rich fast. Well, I, I am not a wealthy man by any means, but I understand that to have any kind of savings, it requires work. I'm convinced that we want to become saints, but we want to become saints without the cross, without the work. And as your pastor, you can't have it that way. That's not the way this works. It is a costly gospel. In fact, I'm convinced that Jesus probably would have been the worst person to teach a membership class to, right? This whole idea of picking up your cross and following me every day, I don't know how appealing that is to us today. If you want to lose your life, you save it, right? And if you want to save your life, you will ultimately lose it. Read the Sermon on the Mount. It's costly stuff. Again, I know we're probably never going to be tempted to turn stone, you know, bread into stone or to throw ourselves out of pinnacle to prove the faithfulness of God. But I know that the lures and the seduction of this world are a very temptation to many of us. But how much do we trust God when things go wrong? I know, I know. What does this text have to tell us about those who struggle with substance abuse or alcoholism? What does the temptation of Christ have to say to them? Or to the couple here whose marriage may be struggling? Or to the small business owner who are struggling to make ends meet? Or to the adolescent who, above all else, craves attention and acceptance and is willing to go to great lengths to get it. What does the temptation of Christ have to do with any of those things? Well, the reality is that the common denominator between all the temptations finds its source in this. All have to do with treating God as less than God. That's the source of temptations. Treating God as less than God. I may never be tempted. In fact, I know for a shadow, beyond a shadow of doubt, I'll never be tempted to turn stone into bread. But I am often tempted to put my trust and maybe my bank account, more than I am the provisions of a good and just God. Or when things seem to just be crumbling from within. It's so easy to run 
to many places than it often is to run into the arms of a heavenly father who knows me better than I know myself. What does the temptation have to say to us? Christ knows. Christ endured. If we will follow the examples of our Savior, who knew within his heart the very word of God, my advice to us is this. Know the word of God. Imprint it on your heart. It won't take away the trials. It won't take away the temptations. But it will give you a foundation upon which to stand. And draw near to the Father. As we have witnessed the Son draw near to his Father. And trust in the Holy Spirit. Who at times does lead us into times of testing. But always in preparation for something greater. Will you stand with me this morning? It's the first Sunday of Lent, and honestly, I, I wasn't I didn't know quite what to expect when I woke up and I saw this white stuff coming down. I'm so glad that you are here this morning. I hope that by now you are as equally as glad that you are here. God is good. God is faithful. You will face times of testing. I promise you that. You will face times of temptation, never by the Father, always by the enemy. But you will face those, and sometimes it will be the subtle whisper that will put a seed of doubt in you. But I can assure you, God is faithful. He will walk with you through your trials. He will bring you to the other side. Because he's a good and beautiful God. We are making our way as the body of Christ to the cross. It will culminate on Good Friday. When we will gather together on that night to remember the passion and the death of our Savior on a cross. In order that we may have life with our Heavenly Father. And it's ultimately going to prepare us for the joy that we're going to have on Easter Sunday when we realize with the rest of the world that the tomb is empty, that death could not contain our Savior, that the great and last enemy has now been defeated and that we can have joy in our hearts today. But you will still face trials. You will still endure temptations on this side. But know that he is a God who is faithful and just and will carry you through whatever it is. But for the next few weeks, our eyes are focused on the cross and what it means to follow God's Son.